Hi guys, I'm Bobsy, and in this video we're continuing on from where we left off last time, where we essentially introduced you guys fully to the concept of prediction, and we also got set up with a sort of basic movement setup with these rolling balls, where physics interactions between them work, both on the client and the server, it should be a very smooth experience, even with ping. So now, from here, let's try and get some cameras set up first of all, so that we can properly follow our balls. Now, there's multiple ways of doing it, and, and there's really not a, a wrong way you can work with cameras however you like. I prefer personally using Cinemachine, I just find it very easy and nice to work with. So I'm just going to set up the Cinemachine camera here. Um, and we can of course do with this whatever that we want, right? But the main thing that I really want is something that follows the player's position. And for this, obviously, we need some kind of tracking target that it actually follows. And also we need to, of course, set the offset that we're following with. So for example, in our case, I want it to be somewhere above and somewhere behind. But in this case, let's just start with this and just have it set up and let's get the tracking target set up. So if we go into scripts, I'm just going to make a, I guess we can call the player camera script. I'm going to open that up. This is going to be a very simple script. First of all, I just want to make it a static. Normally, I'm not always a big fan of making everything static. It can, of course, be a bit uh, funky, but really in our case, it's very, very simple because we only want one of them in the world regardless. So we're just going to set the instance equals to this. And we're just going to make it a very simple setup like this. And let's also just have it reference its Cinemachine camera component, like so. And let's just make it an easy method to set the target. And I guess in our case, it's probably the tracking target that we want to set. So let's just do it like that. And now in the player movement, all we have to do is we have to call the player camera instance. We have to call the set target, and then it should technically start following the player. Now, the good question is, where do you call this? Because right now, obviously, as you notice, we don't have any ownership checks. And that's really a general thing is we don't want ownership checks mostly. But of course, there are cases like this here where we actually want an ownership check. And for this, typically you'd want it when it starts. So in normal networking, you do it in on spawn and you check the owner. And if we are the owner, then we'd set the camera. Well, we can do the same thing here, except here it's not called unspawned, we call it late awake. The reason for this, there is a reason behind the madness, is because it runs very similar to an awake. You know, an awake which essentially runs before the object is even ready. Except this one runs after we made sure that the data is initialized, but it runs very similar to awake. Where an unspawned can technically run late, in theory, which this will not. So, and this is really because of the predicted nature, right? So as soon as it spawns, you already have all the information for it. So what we can do if we can check the owner. So if it's owner, and then if we add owner, we'll go to the player camera dot instance dot set target, and we set it to our transform. And it should really be as easy as that. So let's go and just have a quick test. Let's make sure that we've also set the component on the camera. So Cinemachine camera, I'm gonna give it the player camera, I'm gonna feed it the Cinemachine camera, and that should be it. So I save the scene and we hit play. And now you can see as I move around, the camera moves too. Obviously not a great camera angle, but let's try and fix that. And there's multiple ways to do that. So one thing is we can have it rotate with the follow target, but this is obviously not exactly what we want. So I think let's go back to none here. Let's just reset the position and rotation. And now let's set the actual uh, follow offset of where we want to be. So let's start having it looking down and let's try and change the set as well. And I probably want to be, yeah, I think somewhere around here. It's probably good. So let me do that. Let me copy the component here. So let me copy component of the Cinemachine follow. And also just remember that the rotation was about 53. So I'm going to set it back to 5300. 0, 0, and we're going to paste in the values here. And there we go. Now when I hit play, you should be able to see it. And then now we have a camera that cleanly follows the player. Now that we have the camera following, let's try and add something like a jump, for example. That's a bit of a different thing. And we need a little bit more code for that. So I guess first of all, let me just add a new field up here and just set the jump force. So now with this, let's try and go ahead and make it in our input. So for example, we want a public pool for whether we should jump. Now, of course, the normal way you'd probably think of doing it would be going in here. We'd be writing input dot jump and setting it equals to, in our case, the unity engine dot input dot get key down. And it would be the key code for jump, for example, or we could do key code dot space. That would probably be how you'd normally want to handle it. However, it's very important to understand that get final input only runs on tick. And now ticks obviously don't run on frames. They run well separately on tick. So for example, if we have 10 ticks and we have 100 frames, that's 10 frames for every one tick. But the way that a get key down works, really anything that Unity essentially calls down in terms of input will typically mean that it was clicked this frame. But as I just mentioned, the ticks don't run on frames. So that means if we have 100 FPS on 10 ticks, 
that would essentially be nine frames where we shouldn't click the space power and one frame where we should. And obviously we can't expect that of the player. Now you could solve this a bit by just doing get key, in which case they can just hold it until they jump. But that way it would still miss it if they click very quickly and let go again, and it, it happened to be in between ticks. So obviously that's not very good. But there's a very easy way of doing this and getting around this. And that's going into what we call update input, which is this one, which also takes the reference of input here. Now with update input, we essentially want to set the input equals to, well, actually, we, we want to essentially do the same thing, right? So input.jump uh, to get key down. Pretty much want to do the same thing, um, except obviously now this runs every single frame, but still it only actually executes the input on tick, which means now, sure, when you click space, it will be set to true. But if there's a frame more before the tick, well, then it'll just get set back to false because get key down will be false at that point. So what we can do is we can set this to true if get key down is true or our jump happens to be true because get final input, whenever it runs the input, it resets it. So it gets set back to false automatically after running the tick. So I hope this makes sense. Right now, all that's really happening is just if our jump is true, which means it's been true at any point. So that means, you know, right now it's false. We happen to click it in some frame. Then we go on to the next frame where technically this is false, but now this is true because it was clicked the last frame. So now this one is true which means this will end up coming out as true as well, because this essentially means that if just either of them are true, it'll be true. Um, and you can actually shorten this. We can take this away, and then just instead of equals, we just set this symbol in front. It, it's the exact same line of code. It's just cleaner. So this way, it allows you to use get key down as you normally would with Unity, but just very easily like this. All you really need is just this little figure here, and it will just work. So cool. Now we're getting into our simulate, and we cannot trust that our input works with jumping. So what we can do is if input dot jump, well then we obviously want to do our jump. So let's do rigid body dot add force. Let's do a vector three dot up with our jump force. And let's make it with the force mode of impulse. And that's it. Now jumping should work. And it should be as easy as that. And now we should have pretty smooth and clean jumping too. Now let's bring that over. Let's bring them over. And when I press space, as you can see now we jump. Yeah you can see when I jump here, I can go over here, I can jump into them. If I could hit actually that would work. Let me try and do that real quick. I'm trying to have this one jump and this guy jump into him. And as you can see, the collisions work smoothly on both screens with physics. And I can assure you this also works well with ping. Obviously right now it's just a fully local setup, but this really does work very well. Uh, and notice how sure you might see a slight delay as to when I click here. It, it can, there's a, can be a slight delay before it jumps, but if you look at when it lands and stuff, it's actually very precise, which is exactly what prediction tries to do, sort of predict the future. The thing is, we can't predict when you're going to hit the space bar. We can't predict humans, but we can predict from input. So the fact that you've just jumped. Obviously, we can also add some kind of ground check. Right now, we can jump forever. But really, this idea should get you most of the way. So we can add a simple little ground check. And we can just do that with, like, a, let's do a raycast, for example. So let's do private float ground check distance equals to, let's do 0 0.51. I think it would be slightly longer than the player. Let's also do a layer mask. And let's just do a quick ground check. So let me make a, let's do a private pool. It's grounded. And this is grounded. We'll run like a, yeah, let's do just an if physics dot raycast. Let's do it from transform the position in the direction of vector three dot down. And then we can just out the raycast hit, which calls hit with the ground check distance with the ground layer as a check layer. And if it does indeed hit, or actually we can just return that. We can just return, there you go, just like that. And that should technically do the trick. So now we have the ground check. And now we can just do if jump is clicked and we are grounded, then you can form the jump. Let's now try that. Did I miss something? I did indeed right there. Yeah. And let's see. Okay. So now I move and oh, right now I'm not grounded because I guess the, oh, we didn't, we didn't change the layer mask, of course. Let me go into the prefabs player, the layer mask here and let's just set that to i guess let's put that to default and then let's maybe make a layer dedicated for the player just so we don't hit ourselves or something silly like that so now setting that to player yes change children and there we go now we should be able to i go now we jump and when i spam space you can see i only jump when i hit the ground all right cool so yeah that's working great and now yeah now we have really smooth jumping with a ground check and with clean collisions again and then maybe next time we can make some collision events where we hit each other or we can start shooting or we can picking up stuff or whatever. There's really a lot of ways to go with this. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this so far and I hope you enjoy working with prediction. Remember to join the Pernet channel. 
We there's a lot of really helpful individuals over there, and the channel is growing super well, which just makes us very happy to see. So remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.